And my talk will go into a completely different area now. So just try to switch your brains and start afresh. And for those who know me, is they they will know that I'm always having one leg in method development and one leg in the application of methods. And probably my claim to fame is that we develop two and three and four and five B NMR, very complicated systems and solving big structures. And I will just give a snippet for those of you who don't know much about structural biology at the beginning about what we generally do. And then I give you a story about the methodology that we are developing right now. So when you just think about biology and want to describe an object in biology, you have a very large scale in terms of size of objects. It goes from sort of one nanometer to a meter. And when you describe or want to see an object, you have to use a wavelength that can separate objects of that size. That's why we can see humans and mice and a fly by eyes. But if you want to see objects that are smaller, like a cell or a bacterium, you have to use the microscope. And when you want to see objects that are even smaller than that, you have to get wavelengths that are even smaller than the wavelength of light. And you use X-ray, or you can use NMR, or you can use cryo-VM. And those methodologies are what allows you to get atomic resolution structures of proteins and biological systems. When you do that, I generally will describe to people that if you use one methodology, you will get only one perspective of looking at an object. If you want to describe an object more fully, you will have to look at it from different perspectives. And that means that you have to use different methodologies. And the ones that we can use, as I said, is crystallography, solution NMR, you can use cryo EM or solid state NMR. And again, ideally is the combination of all of those methodologies that gives you as complete a description of the natural object you want to describe. Just to make it clear, philosophically, you can never get a complete description because the complete description would be the object. So over the years, we've used all of the methodologies that are out there to, to describe systems and then interface those methodologies with cell biology, biochemistry, and very frequently computation because you may be able to describe at the atomic level a part of, let's say, a complex assembly, but in order, if you want to see how all of those parts come together, you have to use computation. And my favorite example is the integration of structural methodology that we carry out in the Pittsburgh Center for HIV protein interactions that I've been running for the last 15 years, where we specifically try to structurally characterize HIV proteins when they interact with cellular proteins, either with when the cellular proteins try to interfere with those or activate something which is used and exploited by the virus for its life cycle. And here I show you the atomic structure of the HIV capsid. This is the capsid that encloses the RNA genome. We use X-ray structure of an N-terminal domain 
the NMR structure of the C terminal domain, that's a dimer that links units together. Then in the test tube, we made a large assembly of the capsid protein and got the cryo-EM map of that. And then computationally, we put this all together by molecular dynamics flexible fitting. And once you have those pictures, you then have to go back and say, if the picture tells you that there may be a critical interaction, let's say, between isoleucine 201 and alanine 204, then you have to go and change that interaction and probe in vivo whether that interaction really is important. Because just because you see it in your structure doesn't make it important. You have to disrupt it and then show that this is an interaction that in the in the in vivo situation is true from what you've seen here. The ultimate event for this was then making a entire capsid and I'm getting the movie going. That is a very, very large system. It's 64 million atoms. And every single entity in this capsid is at atomic resolution. Here it's rendered in a more space filling one. And this was then taken from the atomic structure of the tube that was assembled, combined with cryo-EM tomography. Tomography is basically you do a CAT scan through a biological object. You can see here the outline. And just to make things simple, the capsid protein is a single protein. It arranges in a hexameric lattice. And we know that you can never close an object that is from a hexameric lattice. Leonardo da Vinci knew this long before us scientists. So we have to introduce pentameric systems into there. And we just introduce the pentamers at the points of most acute inclination, because when you take a hexameric unit, you cut one out, make it a pentamet, creates curvature, and that's why we put those there. In this way, we could recap recapitulate what a real HIV native capsic looks like in all its glory. So, this integration of methodologies has been my life up to now. And what I wanted to do, maybe the last half of my life or third of my life, go back to basics and make Enema more accessible to everybody who will not come from physics and know how to do all of those methodologies. And there is one particular NMR active nucleus that really lends itself to democratize NMR, and that's the fluorine nucleus. What we use up to now are the nuclei shown here, and we label our normal proteins with C13 and N15 and do all of this fancy NMR. And the hydrogen nucleus is the most sensitive one when you do NMR. And if you look, here for fluorine, it's almost as sensitive as hydrogen. So fluorines are a fantastic nucleus. They have spin one half, they have a high gyroid magnetic ratio, and that's where the sensitivity comes from. And they're 100% abundant, this particular nucleus. So you don't have to enrich with anything. The one property that is the most amazing property is that the shielding of the fluorine nucleus is dominated by this large paramagnetic term. And that means that fluorine chemical shifts or the resonance frequency, they occur over a really large range. And that's at least hundredfold larger than hydrogen. So when you do your organic synthesis, you run a proton spectrum, a C13 spectrum, you have a very small range over which your uh, atomic nuclei will resonate. And that's why 
if you work with big systems, you have the overlap problem. You had we had to develop three and four the NMR, but for fluorine, as you can see, this is not the case. We have a chemical shift range that goes roughly from plus 100 to minus 220. So that's 300 ppm compared to 10 ppm for hydrogens. So this tells you that you will have very rarely resonances overlapping. So the reason why complicated NMR was invented was to deal with this overlap problem. In addition, the precise frequency of the, the resonance is very sensitive to local conformational and electronic changes. So for instance, if a fluorine is situated in an alpha position or a beta position or a gamma position to an oxygen, this already makes a huge chemical shift difference of at least 10 ppm. So we have a very large range over which we can observe the frequencies. And if there are small changes, they will be observable because the frequencies shift. Now, if you ever studied chemistry, you learn that fluorine is the most electronegative element that is in the uh, periodic table. And a carbon fluorine bond is actually one of the strongest bonds known. It's much stronger than a carbon-carbon bond. And it also has influences on the strengths of neighboring bonds. For instance, uh, allylic double bonds are weakened while the single ones are strengthened. The bond length of a carbon fluorine is not identical to a carbon-hydrogen bond length at around 1.1 angstrom. It's 1.4 angstrom, which is much more similar to a carbon-oxygen bond. And although it's often assumed that a CF3 group is similar to an isopropyl group, this is really not correct because it's very different. If you look at here, the, I've rendered them in the more space-filling way. The shapes of these groups are different. And if you want to sort of try to use a CF3 group in an isosteric way, you probably should pick an ether group because it's roughly the same size. Again, the shape is slightly, slightly different. Why is fluorine so interesting to me now? Every single drug that gets into the clinic now, and it's a, it's a biologics or a biosimilar, will contain at least one or two fluorine atoms. And for those of you who are older in the audience, they will know this particular drug, Lipitor. This was the largest grossing drug ever in the world before it came off patent. And for those who recently got infected with COVID and took packs of it, it also has a CS3 group. Every, every molecule that will now get into the clinic will have fluorids. And when you ask the medicinal chemist why that is the case, it's, it's a combination of a historic uh, probably misconception because they thought fluorines make the molecules uh, more lipophilic and they can get better in the cells and their half-life is longer. And indeed, the half-life is longer, but it all has to do simply with P450 degradation because that's what, when we normally... Uh, metabolized drugs, it's P450 that's involved there. So as a very amusing exercise, we decided to look around one afternoon sitting in the patio during COVID and we didn't know what to do, who had what drugs in their pockets and those were part of what was around and Lo and behold, they all had fluorine. And what you can also see is that some of them have a high degree of what is called the active pharmaceutical ingredient, but others have very little. 
So we just decided we take the capsules, open them up, or took the pills, ground them up, and put them into a rotor. And obviously, this, this is now solid material, and you can't do solution NMR, so you use solid state NMR. And I don't go into the details there. And I'll just give you one example. This is the same drug, but two different formulations. These are generics, one from a company called Tiva and the other from a company called Apotex. You look at the spectra, one is shown in magenta here and the other in black, and you can see they're different. So we immediately knew there are two different polymorphs in those two different pills. It's the same chemical ingredient, but they're different polymorphs. And then we can do all the fancy type of NMR. I can tell you in which lattice this particular polymorph is and what the distance is between the fluorines that are arranged in this lattice. And thankfully, we have a very good collaboration with our colleagues at Rooker who can spin in the solid state the rotor very, very fast. You can see here we spin around 60 to 110 kilohertz so that we get relatively sharp lines. Mostly I work on proteins and natural proteins don't have fluorine. There's actually no fluorine in the biological world apart from two molecules. And it's very common in the inorganic world. So you somehow have to get your fluorine into a protein. Three ways, you either take a fluorine-containing moiety that you couple to a reactive group on a protein that's mostly a cysteine, and then you have a fluorine tag on your protein. If you grow a microorganism, you just have in your uh, medium, let's say a fluorinated amino acid, then all of the amino acids of that type in a protein will be labeled with fluorine, or you can use the technology that was originally developed by Pete Schultz, use uh, orthogonal tRNA, tRNA synthesis pairs, and you pick a place in your coding sequence where you want the fluorinated amino acids, you put your stop code on there, and you take that pair and you bring your fluorine in a predetermined position into your protein. And I'll give you a few examples. Initially, you would ask, isn't it bad if you bring a fluorine into your protein? You may do something bad to your protein. And indeed, it may be possible. So I usually tell everybody, if you do this, you have to make sure that what you've done to your protein is benign. And the best way of doing that, you thermodynamically and kinetically characterize your protein. And this is a little protein here where I picked a position right in the center of the hydrophobic core. So if I would do something bad with the fluorine, I should see that. But yeah, you can super, see superposition of unfolding curves, they were either temperature unfolding curve or heotrope unfolding curve. So thermodynamically, we did not inflict any harm on the protein. And we can also, by NMR, map out that whatever is around the fluorine structurally has not changed. The power of the fluorine chemical shift, I want to illustrate with this slide. If you think about a tryptophan, you have four positions of the indole ring where you could introduce fluorines, and we can do this just by feeding precursors. And as you can see here, if you take just the isolated amino acid, these are the slightly lighter colors, you can see that for the fluorines on the tryptophan, they're very, very different chemical shifts. When you then bring this tryptophan or these differently fluorinated tryptophans into a protein, again, they have extremely different chemical shifts. So this tells you even at the same spot on a protein, just the four different positions 
chemical shift overlap is not an issue at all. Uh, for good measure, we crystallize the protein as well and make sure that indeed there is no difference in the protein structure in the crystal structure and the other just a different fluorinated grips shown in the different crystal structures. And we map out what's around your fluorinated amino acid. So in this case, we know that the fluorinated proteins look exactly like the non-fluorinated protein. Now you can do all kinds of neat experiments. You can immediately find out if you put a fluorine somewhere in your protein without knowing anything, whether that position is solvent accessible or it's somewhere else. Obviously, I know the structures I'm working with, but if you had your favorite protein and you would not know whether something is inside or outside, you put a fluorine somewhere and then you record your spectrum in, let's say, 5% D2O, 100% D2O. And then you see a very characteristic shift. And the characteristic shift between an exposed fluorine, depending on the isotope, is roughly around 0.2 ppm. So if you see that difference of 0.2 ppm, then you know that fluorine is facing the water. And here we have one, the four position of this particular tryptophan that is outside, while the other three are inside. A very simple experiment that you can do with any protein you want. The power of fluorine is that we can measure now distances that are much longer than our traditional distances that we do in nosy spectra, where we can measure distances between, let's say, two and a half to maximum seven angstrom. What I'll show you that with this methodology, where we now use paramagnetic tags and the fluorine, we can get distances up to 25, 30 angstrom. This allows you to position domains with respect to each other and put complexes together. And I do use here one example for that. This would be the paramagnetic tag, in this case MTSL. And for good measure, as my lab says, she does three controls too many always. We pick two different positions, position 50 and 52, where we introduce the cysteine, where we tag. And then we use this tryptophan here to put a fluorine on. A very simple way to get distances is from the Solomon Blombard equation. This is shown here. We know what the overall correlation time of our molecule is. We can measure that by other means. And then via this equation, you can get at the distance here. And the distance you extract from measuring the simple peak height or intensity of a resonance in the diamagnetic and paramagnetic state of your protein. And then you just you plot that intensity difference, and from that you get the distance. Very easy. The Distance we expected from the model to the position five was 12 Armstrong. What we measured by our PRE is 11.9 Armstrong. It doesn't really get much better than that. Now we have not only the one position on the tryptophan, we have all four position on the tryptophan, so we can do it for all of those. And again, the measured distances are extremely similar to the one we would expect from the model. And we cannot, we not only do this with tryptophan, there are three little alanines in the protein. So we made four fluorophenyl alanine and then measured from this one paramagnetic uh, to all the three P's. And again, they are spot on as sh they should be. 
And here you see that we measure up to thought 30 angstrom. So this opens a way to getting distances across big systems. The example for using the tRNA tRNA synthesis pair is using a large system, uh, HIV reverse transcriptase, and you'll say, oh, there are hundreds of structures, crystal structures in the PDB. Why do you want to do that? But I'll show you why. For those of you who don't know the system, uh, RT is a heterodimer made out of P51, P66. The only difference between P51 and P66 is that one of the domains, the RNA age domain, is removed. The rest is the same, and it has a typical end of all the polymerases where you have fingers, some palm, and here's the RNA's age domain. Now, there are Obviously, there, there are lots of still interest in getting RT inhibitors. And what people are now trying to get is allosteric inhibitors. And in the crystal structures that are out there, you always have a closed or an open form. And the closed form seems to be the one where the inhibitor is bound. In contrast, if I would ask you what would it be, people always assume that the inhibitor bound one is the closed one, it's not. But these are these allosteric inhibitors. So we decided to pick three positions, one here on the outside of the fingers domain, and it should not really sense what happens in the allosteric side, then one here on the inside where the thumb comes towards the finger so that you can see something, and then one right in the middle where the allosteric inhibitor should find. Very simple spectra. Again, we just run 1D spectra. And for the two positions, in the inside and outside of the fingers domain, we get nice sharp signals. This was a surprise when you have your fluorine here in the palm domain, you get a very broad signal. And what that tells you is that this structure, although it is deceptively looking and nicely defined from the crystal structure, it's not. It's actually very plastic. And this is the hallmark of a very plastic structure. Then you can add inhibitors, the allosteric inhibitors. For instance, ephemerans, you can see here for the outside one, nothing much happens. For the inside one, we end up with two conformers. So we can really see that it's not just one conformation. We have two conformations here. And for the one in the allosteric side, the most obvious change you see that suddenly now we have a sharp signal, which tells you that the binding site and the entire protein rigidifies. So what the allosteric inhibitors do, they not necessarily result in a change of structure, but in a change of dynamics. And we term this dynamic allosteric. And this is true not just for ephemerins, this is true for all of these allosteric inhibitors that bind into that site. And if you are in a field of trying to screen for drugs because if fibrins also have a fluorine, you can in the same experiment monitor the inhibitor binding and monitor what happens to the protein. You can also then look at very, very big systems. I introduced the HRV capsid before, and obviously solution NMR is not the method of choice. You do solid state NMR. But as I said, we put material in a rotor and it gets spun very, very quickly. We, we introduced fluorine into the HRV capsid. And by running particular correlation experiment in the solid state, we can see these cross peaks. They tell you that the fluorines are relatively close in space. And when you measure the buildup of those cross peaks, you can get distances and those distances go out also up to 20, 25 angstrom. So we can map out distances over this very large system. What I really wanted to develop the fluorine NMR 
for is to look in real cells what is going on. For that, you have to get your protein into the cell to carry out in-cell NMR. And there are two ways you can do this. You can use electroporation. That's what molecular biologists use all the time to get their uh, plasma <laughs> into cells. Or you can use what's called uh, toxin delivery. This is and toxin that makes pores, and you can close the pores again with calcium and you get your protein into the system. What is very important when you work in cells, you obviously can't put tags on that are attached to a system where you can have a reducible bond. You have to make sure that whatever you put on stays on in the cell. So nitroxides are out. And if you use what we normally use, um, lanthanide pendants, you have to make sure that the lanthanides bind extremely tightly so that they don't use them in the cell. So it's it's more demanding to have the, the molecules in the cell than if you do it in the test tube. I have just give you a few examples and tell you why fluorine is wonderful for this. You could argue, why don't you use the normal nitrogen labeled protein EHSQC in the cell? Yes, you could, if you could see the signal. We are ubiquitin, a ubiquitous cellular protein. You label it with N15 and you put it into buffer. You get a beautiful spectrum. It's a model protein. People use it all the time. If you put it into the cell, the only resonances you see are the three resonances on the tail. You don't see the protein at all. If you use your fluorinated protein, you have a signal, you can observe it, you can work with that signal. The same is true here for the HRV CTV dimer. There, again, we only get resonances for the tail. And that tells you that non-specific or specific interactions in the cell will influence your signal now because we have only one signal and yes it is broader than a hydrogen but it's observable and we can play with it this is an example of cyclophilin we work on cyclophilin because one of the cofactors for, for the hrv capsid again cyclophilin beautiful normal hsqc spectrum you don't see any resonance in the lysis on the cell just background we can see the signal in the cell. Yes, it's broad, but then we can also add cyclosporin and you can see that the signal shifts. So it's sensitive to that change and it's now much sharper. So we now have a tool for looking at proteins in the cell and measuring distances in the cell at the atomic level with this type of approach. And I just leave you this here again a model protein where we use our lanthanide lanthanide uh, tags this is the in buffer experiment this is the in cell experiment and you can see that we measure a distance between let's say 13.8 and 40.6 which is very much the distance you would expect if there is no change to the protein and this protein is not a human or normal cellular protein, so you would not expect that the uh, distance changes. So with this, we can really now look in cells and map out interactions in the cell with fluorine and NMR. And I did not go through pick, picking out the people who did the work. I have to point out that Elena Matai was a postdoc who very early on develop the uh, fluorine PRE technology, the test tube technology. Neymar Sharaf was a graduate student who brought all of the tRNA, TNI synthetase, uh, specific labeling technology to my lab. She's an assistant professor at Stanford now. And the in-cell work right now is spearheaded by Wen Kai, a postdoc in the lab and all the solid state NMR is going on with a colleague of mine at the University of Delaware, Tatiana Polonova, who always has 10 graduate students and they love to tinker around in collaboration with me. And this is 
the first picture we had after COVID, where we are now not in mass on the balcony of our building. And uh, hopefully this will continue in the future. And with this, I finish. And for those of you who have never been to Pittsburgh, before I moved there, I've never been to Pittsburgh. And why would you have ever been to Pittsburgh? But it's quite an attractive city because it has four river banks compared to most cities because there are two rivers, the Allegheny and the Morgaheny, that come together there. And from here on, it's called the Ohio. So it has more bridges than Venice, and it is quite an attractive one. Thank you.